Hi, everybody. Uh, my name's uh, Anissa Sanusi. I'm a UI UX designer from Hutch Games based in London. So I just want to say I hope you guys are having a great conference. Yeah, connect. Uh, where are we? Control, control conference. Yes. <laughs> Okay, so uh, I have not had this big of an audience since GDC, so I'm a little bit nervous. I'm so sorry. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> so I used to work in PC games, but now I am designing for mobile. I really like to thank everyone for coming over because uh, I wasn't sure if pe anyone would show up at all. But yay, people! <laughs> okay, <laughs> so let's start. <clears throat> The user interface is the dimension that lies between humans and machines. It is the plane of interaction between um, the operator, which is us, and the device. And at its best, its design is guided by our instincts to make the experiences with our devices stressless and enjoyable. Over the years, it has evolved into an art form as our interactions with technology become more complex and our desire to immerse ourselves in virtual spaces grow. Terms like human-computer interaction and user experience now define style and interactivity in where a computer creates a versatile exchange of dialogue with humans. So we're going to explore where modern UI came from, how they're unified into a global understanding of recognizable patterns, and what may lie ahead in the years to come. So in the early days of computing computers, um, the early computing machines relied on manual input with punch cards. It was developed on the backdrop of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, when they were automating the loom machines, they had like little cards with holes in them, and then uh, they would punch through it, and then you get a pattern of really nice fabrics. So uh, early computers, like the Difference Engine and Analytical Engine, were manual. You had to crank a lever to make it work and do the computing. And there's no immediate reactions or no real-time feedback. If you remember the very first programmer, uh, Ada Lovelace, she actually programmed for the Analytical Engine there. So. So these machines were really good at a single job. Um, so in the 30s and 40s during World War II, uh, it was very, very good for uh, general. Oh. So these machines were really good at a single job, which is to um, crack codes and help out with the war. But they were still using punch cards at the time, even though uh, we have the power of electricity. So when the war was over, people were still kind of tinkering with the machines. And if you see the little EdSec machine there, that one, uh, it has like a second purpose after the war. So the cathode ray tube amusement device was, um, it was the first electronic um, amusement device. It wasn't really a video game, but it was something that people kind of had fun with. And then after the war, the... EdSec, the EdSec machine, uh, someone programmed the OXO game on it, the, the tic-tac-toe. So the player entered their input using a rotary telephone uh, controller, selecting which of the nine squares on the board where they want to move next. So their move would appear on the screen, and then the computer's move would follow. So this is the very first instance of uh, playing with an AI. And as you can see, oh, shit. Oh, I'm not supposed to say shit, I'm sorry. Oh, fucking hell. I mean, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I've never used this thing before, so I'm just like not sure. Anyway, so this, the, this is where the tic-tac-toe is can seen, and it's a tiny little dot there. So this machine took up the whole entire space, and that's the tiniest of displays. So back then, it took a whole building just to power a tic-tac-toe game. All right, moving on from that. So we have tennis for two. Um, so a physicist designed this game after learning that the analog computer could simulate trajectories with wind resistance, and it displayed on a oscilloscope, and it was played with two custom aluminum, aluminum controllers. So it's kind of um, so these things you, you probably see in like war films or anything like that, and people still found ways to have fun with it. 
So come Space War, which is the very, which is the birth of video games as we know it. So this is the first time we had real, ta real time display. The game features two spaceships, the Needle and the Witch, engage in a dogfight while maneuvering the gravity well of a star. And the gravity well is in the middle of the circular display there. And this is also the very first instance of a UI in a video game, uh, as you can see there. You can see which player has how many lives left. It will just appear for a little bit, it will disappear, and then it's game, and then appear again, da, 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 da. So this game basically inspired the next one, which is the computer space. Um, the computer space was the first arcade video game. So the computer space release marked the beginning of the commercial video game industry. The game's novelty was also part of its appeal to players. Most people have never seen a television screen displaying images being controlled by a person right in front of it. It's usually a TV program that was um, shown by a remote TV station. So half of the UI is actually embedded in the actual cabinet itself. There you can see it says uh, rocket, saucer, and time. And the only moving part is the numbers. So, as we leave the 60s behind, computer games are becoming a real thing. It's time for them to come out of the lab and into the real world. So around this time, pinball is a massive thing in the 1970s. Where that's where you find pinball machines in places where people would meet for and to have fun and drink. And computer games will need to compete with it. But before we go into games, let's go back to uh, our computer or <laughs> computers. Prior to this, computers were made for computer operators, programmers, and experts. So you need prior knowledge of computing. Keyboard and monitor being the only direct way of sof um, <laughs> sorry, for software and human to communicate. With the introduction of the computer mouse, it paved the way for the graphical user interface. From now on, I'm going to say it as GUI. Yay. So the Alto was the first computer designed from its inception to support an operating system based on a graphical user interface, later using a desktop metaphor that we're really familiar with now. It gave form and function to the design of computers for human use and not just people who are experts at numbers and coding. From the Alto came the Xerox Star. The GUI allows users to interact with the computer through secondary interactions, such as icons and input fields, as opposed to learning command line interfaces, which is coding. The ingenious technology provided access to significantly larger population of people to decipher and experiment with computers after its introduction. Although not commercially successful, Star greatly influenced future developments, especially the Apple Lisa. So Steve Jobs actually went to Park where Xerox Star and Alto was developed and he kind of looked at it and was like, oh, okay, we, he was kind of inspired to make the Apple Lisa from there. The Apple Lisa was the first commercially successful product to use a multi-panel window, window interface. What's present are all the logical components of GUIs that we know now. It's just stuff like icons, windows, scroll bars, sliders, and everything. It's a little sobering to reflect on, the, on that most of what we have learned to add to GUIs since like the 70s and 80s is pretty much just eye candy. Right now, the most that we've innovated is just colors, animation. Everything like the basics has been done around this time. So let's get back to video games. And we have Pong. And it was a massive hit. It was the first video game that was a massive commercial success. Moreover, it basically launched the video game industry as we know it today. Based off a ping pong game that came with the Magnavox Odyssey, it was the, um, the Magnavox Odyssey was actually the first ever video game home console. So early machines marked the efforts to display information back to the user. So you have uh, a score there between two players. <clears throat> The game's first trial run as an arcade machine was so successful that it was physically jammed with too many coins. People just kept coming back to play more of it. So home consoles became popular with the Atari. So the Atari unit came with the joystick, which was a universal controller that unlike the old Pong rotary controllers that was winding up like that, <clears throat> this could work with a variety of different games, more than just one. The idea of a home computer is still expensive. They were really big and clunky and slow and costed, I don't know, $12,000 or something stupid like that. No one could afford it. But home consoles, though, they were cheaper to produce and cheaper to sell. And you could just have one that you could share with the family. 
So con home consoles are a much more viable gateway to video games. And as you can see here, um, the UI is still pretty much the same. It's just numbers. It's just to tell you how much time you have left or how much score do you have. It's very much just functional. And then came the boom of stuff like Space Invaders and Pac-Man. Arcade units borrowing retention tricks from pinball, basically having keeping high scores and keep, keeping people to um, keeping people to come back. Um, bright colors and sounds and just getting just making it really really interesting. Um, I'm sure if you've seen any 80s movies, there's like always an arcade game where it's like just super bright colors, neon colors, and just loads up beep, 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 beep. So that was the that was the pull to get people interested. <clears throat> So the UI here is still very much purely functional to show you how to play, keeping track of scores, and basically it's just a bare minimum for players to understand what's happening. And we'll go back a little bit quickly to the PC. Uh, around this time, this is what it looked like. The Amiga, Macintosh, and Windows are shaping up with the new GUI patterns introduced by the early Xerox, Alto, and Star. Part of what made the first Macintosh a pivotal event was that Apple reinvented and improved it. The development involved deeper investigation of interface psychology and design that anyone hasn't attempted before. Apple successfully claimed the leading role in carrying forward UI. UI, as it proved, could sell computers to the mass market. Microsoft and others in the personal computer market kind of scrambled to adapt. As you can see there with Windows 1.0, it was a little bit ugly and unsuccessful, and it was garishly colorized, and the GUI didn't support basic features like overlapping windows. They largely failed to displace uh, Microsoft's own MS-DOS. So Microsoft's time was not just yet. It's coming up, but not right now. In the next 10 years, the UI releases started to incorporate features such as color, higher resolution displays, uh, and better processing power. But the UI design remained relatively consistent. As you can see, this is very familiar to us even now. So, we are now here at the golden age of games. As the computer world is still trying to find their feet, video games have been accelerating at top speed. Thanks to a low barrier of entry, um, this is the golden age, where, as you can see, does, all of these titles are still going, in, going on now. We're still playing legacy titles from this time. The UI is still constrained by the platform, so though ultimate, ultimately it's utilitarian, I can't say this word, <laughs> utilitarian. So it's ultimate utilitarian. There's an emergence of personality in it. Icons are now part of the rhetoric of the game branding, like Mario's head as a, as a pointer, or uh, the hearts representing lives in Zelda, the iconic finger pointer in Final Fantasy. So we're starting to, to connect icons with certain video games. With better processing came better and more complicated UI such as nested menus that you find in RPGs. Blech. Color schemes are taken into account more seriously as well, because I don't know about you, but I really like how the UI looks like in that. It's like everything's quite coherent. <clears throat> so a huge amount of video games and technological groundwork was done in the 70s and 80s, but when uh, the 90s came, video games have matured enough that the UI are no longer purely functional. It's now recognizably part of the entire aesthetics and design of the game. Emerging here is the stylized UI based on genre and overall art direction. By this time, the staples of video games of uh, UI have been established. Things like health bars, leaderboards, option screens. Here we see, the st we see how fundamentals of color theory, information architecture, and sophisticated sound design has emerged. We have become accustomed to communicating language between game designers and players at this point. <clears throat> One thing you want to know is the start of the internet and portable phones. Like that. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what the internet looks like at the time, so here you go. Um, but uh, Spoiler, they're, they're kind of small and babies right now. They're not big yet, but in the future, I have a feeling they might have a big thing. So by the mid-90s, the big technological breakthrough was the CD. And now you can fit a lot of bytes in one disc, and games can finally traverse through the third dimension. So this is where 3D broke out. Here, video games are now mainstream. People have heard about Atari, Nintendo, and Sega. So enter Sony with the PlayStation 1. 
uh, alongside Nintendo 64 is Sega Dreamcast. Video games now have big, powerful companies backing them up, and we see the seedlings of their branding here. From the boot-up screen, players familiarize themselves with the factions. And within the consoles themselves, you can, ha you can see how they are branching out to a platform for more than just games, but other medias like music players. I'm sure if you're looking at that right now, you can just hear the Sony song going, I, I don't know, I can't make the sound, but you, you know what it sounds like. So, it's also a very special time for a PC, uh, because this is where nine, Windows 95 and the Mac OS 8 and 9 was widely used everywhere. Computers are now uh, in family homes, regardless if someone knows how to code or not. Finally, this technology is now commonplace. So thanks to 3D, designers and artists alike get very creative with the UI. We now have the spatial element of the game uh, to play with, uh, the 3D space. You know, it's not, we're just not locked into just the 2D space anymore. So in 2009, a thesis on game UI coined these four terms to describe the different UI theory, just to go them, to, I wanna go through them really quickly. So non-diegetic UI is the traditional UI elements. These elements have the freedom to be completely removed from the game's fiction and geometry and can adopt their own visual treatment. There are things like health bars and heads-up displays, so things are just floating on that screen. Spatial is when 2D UI elements are used in the 3D space. It's used when there's a need to break the narrative in order to provide more information to the players. They'll sit within the geometry of the game's environment. Sometimes we have UI elements that don't fit within the geometry of the game world. They, can, they still min maintain the game's narrative, but sit on a 2D hub plane. So these are called meta elements. A common example is like the blood splatters when you're playing FPS and your health bar is low. And last and not, and definitely not least, the, everyone's favorite, which is the diegetic user interface, where it exists within the game world, both narrative and 3D space, so the player and avatar can interact with them through visual, audible, or haptic means. Well-executed diegetic UI elements enhance a narrative experience for the player, providing a more immersive and integrated experience. So that's one, that's one example. Ooh. That's one example of um, a health bar at the back of a character. And also Fallout, when you want to check your little arm thing, it actually physically goes up to the screen. Cool. So now we've survived Y2K, and uh, the new millennium is upon us. What do we have now? Enter a new player, the Microsoft Xbox. Around this time, the consoles themselves would have their own hub and a brand identity propped up by their UI. We have Sony going for the sleek, fashionable look with their fancy glass rendering um, and a chunky Xbox and their hardcore gamer green blobby slush things, really edgy, I guess. Uh, I think part of this could have been driven by Microsoft um, desperately trying to separate their new console from the image of being the guys who made MS Office. And, of course, the Nintendo GameCube stayed true to their playful persona. Console games uh, UI at this stage are all pretty familiar, but the DS introduced the stylus-based gameplay. So we begin to see a UI design that has more in common with early PDAs and Palm OS. So there's also an exciting time for um, Windows and Mac. Apple and Microsoft released two new operating system upgrades, which is the OS X and Windows XP. Visually, Microsoft's most innovative OS, um, sorry, the XP is the most innovative OS they've had since 95. The graphical emphasis starts with the opening screen and a full screen logon, and more space is taken up with visual artifacts. So the start button used to be gray and boring, but now it's uh, bright and, and blobby looking. The icons are bolder and more colorful, and application windows look softer because they have got rounded corners and they look more sculpted uh, with gradients and things like that. So meanwhile at Apple, this is also when Apple had those very super colorful um, computers, if you remember those. Uh, to complement the new colorful design of Apple's computers, the company decided to build its new operating system with a UI that was more endearing and easy to the eyes. It settled on uh, Aqua. Uh, which is that, what that blue thing is. Based on water, Aqua featured a number of water droplet-like elements that could be found in the status bars and buttons. So Steve Jobs had a really famous quote on this UI where he said, we made the buttons on the screen look so good you'll want to lick them. I did not want to lick my computer, just saying. 
But so, and this is also during the time when uh, the PC and Mac had a little bit war of like, I'm a PC and I'm a Mac. I do this and I do that. Yeah. So that was a good time. <clears throat> By this time, um, there is widespread participation in MMOs because the internet has gotten better. Uh, players are playing with other people. Some of those players are very into their games and they make their own UI. Um, if you see that, that clusterfuck, I mean, sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Uh, yeah, so you see that it's a bit messy, but it works for some reason. Um, people, t people are starting to mod their UIs by themselves just to, to do whatever they want. The Sims took off and people were modding their own clothes and their own items and uploading it to the internet and sharing it. So this was the height of personalization in PC gaming. Right, so moving on from there. Around this time, the big three have set settled into their own brand identities. The PS3 and Xbox 360 had an agenda of pushing technological limits. They just wanted better graphics, better sound, better everything. Whilst the Nintendo Wii was pushing the limits of what it means to be a video game at all, with the introduction of nunchucks, a really big departure from um, a very conventional gamepad. UI-wise, the PS3 held on to their sleek looks. This was at a time when Blu-ray was taking off, and I feel Sony have moved on from a gamey art direction into, uh, in order to tie in non-gamers to buy the consoles, even if it's just to be used as a Blu-ray device. If you remember, uh, HD DVD didn't take off because, uh, because of that, basically. Blu-ray took off. I have five minutes, what? Uh, okay, so... The Xbox 360 have ditched their edgelord look and went clean. It's still very much geared towards gamers, and Nintendo's minding their own business with their cutesy soft look. And Windows and Mac both got sexy as well. Move away, they moved away from bright colors and playfulness to modern and glossy. The OS UI now has gone very high fashion. So, oh shit, I forgot to say, iPhone came out. Yeah, it was a big deal. <laughs> Uh, okay, so around this era, games UI haven't had a big design breakthrough, meaning the tropes and rules have already defined. But this is also when specific teams of people doing only UI are important, so you can get a job as a UI artist. Um, so now we've caught up to uh, today. So we live with our devices on a daily basis, constantly have uh, phones with us, all of our games consoles have reached equilibrium of UI sophistication. Open up P uh, PS4 and Xbox uh, One, and you'll see the flat design you're already familiar with through PC and Mac and phone OS. So m at this point, minim minimalism is on vogue. Less is more. Games are getting increasingly cinematic. It's all about immersion. You know what doesn't help immersion? Fucking UI. So there's a big shift towards minimalistic UI, where they are barely there or just enough to aid players. In fact, some games don't even have UI. You could argue that the best UI is no UI, right? So where did the UI go? Um, did I mention the iPhone? Yeah, well, they went to smartphones. So the smartphones ushered in a new age of video games. The access to smartphones and the robust App Store means the barrier of entry of people to play games is close to zero. So anyone can just pick up something and play on the go. Um, game interfaces begin to lean into developing trends of how we play mobile games. We're not sitting down and playing for hours anymore. We're playing games uh, that are quick to pick up, can be easily put down, and just quite easy to master. So some games are purely UI, whilst others mask it entirely. Okay, so we're at a really cool position right now where the... Uh, there's an existing ecosystem of different platforms copying off of each other. So we have like Reigns using the Tinder mechanic of swiping. Uh, this is a, a Ludum Dare game jam from a friend of mine, and he, it's basically a parody of Windows 1995. I, you should totally play it, it's funny as fuck. Uh, and her story and Sarah's missing, which is those two. Um, they're just basically completely fake UI, but then we're so used to using different OS, um, operating systems every day that we can just work it without really thinking about it. This is also my favorite. Um, UI has become an animatic art form in itself that people want to cosplay them. Who would have thunk you want to play, a, you want to be a button? So, there's also new ways of player input using the chat system on Twitch, a streaming platform, uh, redefining the very idea of multiplayer co-op. 
Were you there when this happened? I was there when this happened. I did not do work at all. I was just watching this happening. It's crazy. I have two minutes. <laughs> okay. Almost done. So UI designers are bridging the gap between real life and interfaces with digital. So we've got this, which is skeuomorphic design, where we copy like real life stuff to and transfer them into digital. And this was really popular when the iPhone first came out, if you remember that. Uh, right now, though, we're doing the exact same thing, but with voice recognition. So the uh, Alexa, Siri, and OK Google, they're all actually skeuomorphic versions of um, a human in an AI body. Um, in the space of AR, we are playing around with the idea of different planes crashing together. So this is um, an AR project of visualizing sound in 3D space and time. So when the guy is going back there, you could hear the go, he's making weird noises, but you can still kind of hear, hear them back as he moves through the space. That's really cool and all, but we also have a long way to go. So with VR, players are completely immersed in sight and sound, but why stop there? We could add motion, we could add um, other things. Sorry. <laughs> so this is what happens when a games company have way too much money. So uh, we, we've tried smell now, and why not we try wind and pressure and temperature? The possibility is endless. And this is real, by the way. This is an actual thing that you could put on your face. Uh, I have a few friends try it out. Yeah, it's a bit gross. Anyway, okay, let's wrap this up. <clears throat> Maximization of usability and user experience are two of the main considerations when designing for a UI. These ideas are significant because machines are, in most respects, made by people for people especially in video games, as playing is an intrinsic motivation for learning. This entire story is a marvelous lesson for user interface designers in how design innovation doesn't happen in a vacuum. UI design is no more separable than other forms of engineering and art, from accidents of history and the constraints of economy. Understanding the complex way that we got here, to get where we are now, helps with thinking about design problems, not simply as exercises, but also a response to human needs. So moving forward, I hope uh, you learned something. <laughs> and I'm really sorry for all the swearing. <laughs> and uh, yeah, if you, if, you're, if you fancy doing some UI UX stuff and you always have questions, I, my DMs are always open and you can find me after the talk. And I hope you learned something new today.